We are in Hebrews chapter 10 today. The book of Hebrews is such an amazing book, and the author has been building this case for the supremacy of Christ, for who he really is and what he's done. And today we're going to talk about the reality that we have been perfected for all time. And that, that's a hard concept for us. Because when you think about things in this life, there's nothing that's perfect. Everything is flawed. Everything fails. I mean, when you look around and you say, man, that is the perfect sunset. Well, guess what? The next day it could be just as perfect or better. There's always room for improvement in anything you do in this life. There's always room for growth. But it's not that way with God's love. God's love for us is perfect. And he has perfected us for all times. And that's hard for us to comprehend. The verse that we ended with last week, I wanted to read it again because it kind of sets the stage for where we're going today. So we ended it, uh, verse 10. So I'm going to read to you Hebrews chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. Behold, I have come to do your will. This is a prophecy about Jesus. He does away with the first in order to establish the second. Doing away is the doing away of the first covenant to establish the second covenant. We are in the covenant established through his blood, which is the covenant of grace. And by that will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. It's a one-time deal. Jesus doesn't have to die over and over and over again. He died once for all, that our sins might be washed away, that we might be justified, reconciled to God, and saved. So in the next part of this text, the writer contrasts. The old covenant priest, or the high priest, with Jesus, our great high priest. Uh, the fact that Jesus sat down, and we'll look at that in the text, after he ascended to the Father is proof that his work is completed. The ministry of the priest in the tabernacle was never done. Not only was it never done, it was never different. They offered the same types of sacrifices Day in and day out, over and over. And that constant repetition is proof that their sacrifices did not take away sins. If they had taken away sins, they wouldn't have had to do it over and over and over again. What tens of thousands of animal sacrifices could not accomplish, Jesus accomplished with one sacrifice forever. That's good news. I mean, that is great news. What he did for us is complete, we call that his finished work. When Jesus died on the cross, he took away all of our sins. His work is complete. So the author goes into verse 11, and he says, and every priest, talking about the Old Testament Levitical priesthood, and every priest stands daily in his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time. Now think about that phrase for a minute. When Christ had offered for all time. What do you think that means? For all time. It means that every sin that anyone had committed before Christ, during Christ, and after Christ could be taken away. For all time. He offered one sacrifice. For anyone who looked to Jesus, trusted in Jesus, could have all their sins washed away. Anyone in the past, anyone in the present, anyone in the future. For all time. A single sacrifice for sins. He sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemy should be made a footstool for his feet. The phrase, sat down, refers us again to Psalms 110 verse 1, where the psalmist said, the Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. God is saying to God, God the Father speaking to God the Son, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Christ is in the place of exaltation and victory. Why? Because his work is finished. He is seated because he is at rest. He's no longer working. He doesn't have to offer a sacrifice over and over again. He is victorious, and he is seated at the right hand of the Father. 
he will overcome every enemy and establish his kingdom when he returns. His eternal kingdom. And we will reign with Christ in that kingdom because of what Christ did for us. Is that not good news? Man, that's the best news I ever heard. And we are perfected forever. Believers are complete in him, Colossians 2.10, with the fullness of Christ. We have a perfect standing. Hear me. We have a perfect standing before God because of the finished work of Christ. You say, what does that mean, a perfect standing? We are in a complete right relationship with God. It is perfect. So that when God sees us, we are perfected in Christ for all times. He doesn't see your sin anymore because Jesus took all your sin away. That's why the author went on to say in verse 14, for by a single offering, that's Christ, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. Now, I know a lot of you have been taught all your life that you could lose your salvation, that you could be saved and then not be saved. You could be saved, then not be saved. It's not the truth. If you are truly in Christ and he has washed away all of your sins, no one is powerful enough to undo what Christ has done. No one. Nobody can take away what God has given you. If you receive the gift of salvation, that's what it is. It is a gift according to Ephesians 2, 8, 9. It's the gift of God. Nobody can take that away from you. You say, what about the person who says they know Jesus and then later on in life they go out and maybe they never really knew Jesus. It's real easy to say, I know Jesus. The devil knows Jesus, but he's not a follower. The demons shudder and they believe in Jesus, but they're not following Jesus. You have to understand that if you're truly in Christ, your propensiation, your capacity, your desire will be for Christ. It will be for him. So he says, for by a single offering, he has perfected for all time. By a single sacrifice, one sacrifice, which is in contrast to the many sacrifices offered by the priest, right? Day in, day out, again and again. But he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. We are in the process, every believer, of what we call progressive sanctification. God is progressively sanctifying us, setting up us apart for his glory, for his use. Every day, he is at work in you. Whether you know it or not, whether you see it or not, he is at work in you, moving you. He's using your circumstances. He's using your relationships. He's using everything in your life, bringing you closer to Christ if you are a Christ follower. He is faithful, even when you're not. And that's imperative to understand. Now, this author doesn't ever really talk about progressive sanctification. When he's talking about sanctification, he's talking about our state in Christ, that we are holy and separated for the glory of God. He is not writing about progressive sanctification. He's talking about our position in in Christ. The translation in this verse, being sanctified, it sounds like a continuing process, but it ignores the force of the expression made holy or sanctif sanctified in verse 10. And when you combine them together in the Greek, you see that the rendering would better be written if it were them who are sanctified. That, that would be a better rendering. Them who are sanctified, not being sanctified, because we are sanctified in Christ. Now, we believe as believers in progressive sanctification, and that is the work of the Holy Spirit. He is progressively changing us. But the author, because he's writing to Jewish believers, is focused on the position of the believer in Christ and what Christ has done for them through his sacrifice. That's the focus here when he's writing, and you have to understand that. Uh, the, the status that we have in God is, is perfection. And I know that, like I said, that's hard for us to wrap our minds around. 
in the sense that we have the full acceptance of God because of Christ, we are perfect in the fact that we can enter into his presence. I mean, if heaven is perfect, right? Everybody believes that heaven is perfect. And if we are imperfect, we can't enter into a perfect place. So God has perfected us through the death of Christ. And what that means is that he has imputed his righteousness on us. That's called justification. When we were saved, when we were justified, God imputed his righteousness on us so that we would be perfect in the sight of God. Does that mean that you don't struggle with sin? Of course you do. You're still going to struggle with sin. That's why there's progressive sanctification. Because God is making you holy through your trials, through your struggles, through your circumstances, through your relationships. He's working all things together for your good. That's still happening in your life. But when God looks at you because you are his child, you are perfected in Christ. And when you wrap your, rhyme, your mind around that, that we have full acceptance into the throne room of God, into the presence of God through the death of Jesus, it's amazing that you can enter into his presence at any time. So the author goes on to say in verse 15, and this is imperative. And the Holy Spirit also bears witness to us. Pay attention to that. And the Holy Spirit also bears witness to us. For after saying, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my laws on their hearts and I will write them on their minds. Then he adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. So here's a question for you, all right? Think about this. How do you know personally, you as an individual, that you have a perfect standing before a holy God? How do you know personally today that you have a perfect standing before a holy God because of the witness of the Holy Spirit who bears witness with your spirit. Go read 1 John. The Spirit of God bears witness with your spirit through the Word of God that you are in a right relationship with God. When you're out of fellowship with God, the Holy Spirit's role is to convict you and draw you back into fellowship. The problem with most of us is we end up struggling with guilt. All right? And the problem with guilt is guilt always pushes you away from God. What we need to do is turn to God. So what we need is to listen to the Holy Spirit who brings conviction. The devil's the one who sows guilt in your life. The devil's making you feel bad for all the wrong things you've done. God wants you to feel conviction so that you run to God. When Adam and Eve, when Adam and Eve fell in the garden, what did they do? They ran away from God. They felt guilt, which led to shame, and they ran away from God because they were afraid. We need to experience conviction from the Holy Spirit because he is bearing witness because his job is to lead us and guide us. He will convict us of our sin, which will bring us into the presence of God. We will run to God instead of running from God. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Guilt is not your friend. Understand that when you're feeling guilty, you need to bring that to God. You need to lay that down. You need to let that go. You need to turn to God in repentance, confess your sins, and know that what he says is true. The Holy Spirit's job is to bear witness of the work of the Son of God, of what he's done for us. I mean, right here the author is quoting from Jeremiah 31, which was a promise to the people. 31 verses 33 and 34 a part of a passage that he already quoted in Hebrews 8, verses 7 through 12. God will write his laws on our heart and on our minds. What, why? Because the Old Testament law was all external. It was all about ceremonies and washings and rituals. Our relationship isn't external at all. It's internal. It's about the Holy Spirit living in us. God in you. 
Christ in you, the hope of glory. It's internal, not external. The Old Testament was all based on works. Ours is based on grace. Our relationship with God is based on what Jesus did. Their relationship was based on what they did. Our relationship has nothing to do with what you do, and I know that's so hard to wrap your mind around because everything in this world is conditional. Everything. Your relationship to your spouse is conditional. You say, no, it's not. I love my wife unconditionally. I love my husband unconditionally. Well, let them go have an affair and see how much you love them. Right? It's conditional. I'll scratch your back if you scratch my back. We live in a conditional world where everything is based on the way we treat each other. But God's love for us, and that's why it's so hard for us to wrap our minds around, is completely unconditional. It's not based on anything that we do. It's based on everything that Christ did. And that is amazing. I mean, you're talking about good news. This text is filled with good news. It's about what Christ did for us. It's not about what we do. And the Holy Spirit's job is to lead us and to guide us. No Old Testament worshiper could say that he had no more consciousness of sin. Hebrews 10, 2, right? We saw that last week. No Old Testament worshiper could say they had no more consciousness of sin. But the new covenant worshiper, you and I, can proclaim that his sin is remembered no more. Can you? Because that's a theological truth. Your sin is remembered no more. If your sin was remembered before God every day, then you would have to make an offering every day. Jesus would have to die over and over and over. And that's what he's going to get to when we get to verse 26, which is the fourth warning in the book of Hebrews. And we'll see that next week. You can't sacrifice Christ. Oh, he's not going to die over and over because he paid for your sins once for all. Now, I wish that we could love each other unconditionally. But we're fallen beings. And that's why we need a redeemer. Our sins are remembered no more, and you need to remember that. I need to remember that so that we walk in his grace. The text is a testimony given by the Holy Spirit and shows that final forgiveness is just as the new covenant promised, which means that there was no further need for any sacrificial system or any sacrifices for sin. As the writer will shortly show us, that if you turn from that sacrifice, that ultimate sacrifice, there is no other sacrifice. That's why Jesus is the only way. Because there is no other way. There is no other means, no other substitutionary atonement. There is no other way to pay for your sin. Jesus is the only way. And because of Christ's sacrifice, the way has been opened. The door has been kicked wide open. We haven't an awesome relationship with God, or you can have. I mean, it's, it's available. It's available for every one of us as believers to live in the presence of God because of the sacrifice of Christ. So the author says in verse 19, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence. What is that? We have confidence. What's our confidence in? Is my confidence in my ability to perform? No. Because I fail God all the time. I can't have confidence in myself because I let myself down, much less let God down. Our confidence isn't in us. Our confidence has to be in Jesus and in Jesus alone. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places, by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. No Old Testament worshiper would have been bold enough 
to try to enter into the holy of holies. Not one of them. Even the high priest only entered the holy of holies once a year. There was a thick veil that separated the holy of holies from the holy place. So there's the holy places and then there's the holy of holy. And there was a 10 inch thick veil that separated the holy place from the holy of holies. Which was a barrier between the people and God. The barrier was there for a purpose. To keep the people from the presence of God. You could not enter into the presence of God. Only the death of Jesus could tear the veil and open the way into the heavenly sanctuary where God dwells. And that's exactly what happened. Mark chapter 15, verse 37 and 38 says this. And Jesus uttered a loud cry, and then he breathed his last. What do you think that cry was? And Jesus uttered a loud cry. To tell us die. It is finished. That's what he said right before he died. It is finished. The debt has been paid in full. And then what happened? That barrier between God and man ripped into from top to bottom. Look at the text. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. There are people all over the world that don't believe in Jesus. But all they got to do, if they really want to know the truth, is look at the facts. The reality is that that curtain was 10 inches thick and it tore from top to bottom. And Jesus cried out in a loud voice, it is finished. Because it was done. There was no separation. There was no need for God to keep a distant relationship from man anymore. Because Jesus tore that veil. Historically, that veil was never repaired. The temple was eventually destroyed in 70 AD. And it was never rebuilt which is God's signature on the world that there's no more need for sacrifice. He's made that known to the world, but the world still rejects Jesus as Lord and Savior. Jesus is the only way. And that temple tore. The veil, I mean, can you imagine? Ten inches thick from top to bottom, never repaired, never put back together as a symbol of what God has done for us. There are three phrases that the author uses. Verse 22, he says, let us draw near. Verse 23, he says, let us hold fast. Verse 24, he says, let us consider one another. This threefold invitation, it hinges on our boldness to enter into the Holy of Holies. And the boldness that we have rest on the finished work of Christ. If we don't understand that, we will never understand the access we have to this relationship and these relationships. But what Christ has done for us is beyond amazing. I mean, it is truly beyond amazing. We have entrance into the presence of God, not through the blood of animals, but through the shed blood of Jesus. And this open way into God's presence, man, it was a new. It wasn't like the old that was vanishing away, that was dying. It is living. Because Christ ever lives to intercede for us, right? Hebrews 7.25. He ever lives to intercede for us. Christ is the new and living way. We can come to God through Christ who is our high priest at any moment of any day. The creator of the galaxies, the planets, the stars, the one who hung the moon, who placed the sun. You can enter into his presence to the Holy One. 
at any moment of any day, day after day, week after week, the invitation is yours. All you got to do is turn to him, come to him. His arms are wide open. They were nailed that way. And he's waiting for us to fellowship with him because he loves us. And that is amazing that he loves us enough to open the door to have real fellowship with us. He's given us an open invitation. You have an open invitation into the presence of God. It's open. What are you waiting for? I mean, as much time as you want to spend with God, it's there. You can be with him as much as you choose to be with him. You can sing to him. You can talk to him. You can ask of him. You can praise him. As much as you want to, he has opened the door and nobody can ever shut it. What Jesus has done can never be undone. What a tremendous privilege we have. Can I get an amen? amen. What a privilege to enter into the presence of God. That privilege has been given to us, but how many of us, man, we take that for granted. We take it for granted and we just get busy. And we spend time thinking about all these other things and our minds are running all over the place and we got things we want to do and don't do. We just forget that he's waiting for us. Longing to fellowship with us. That's why he opened the door. He wants us to abide in him so that we'll bring glory to him. But we can't bring glory to him unless we're abiding in him. Because we'll never bear fruit on our own. We can't. We can't bear fruit apart from Christ. So the author says, let us. It's an invitation. Let us draw near. Let us. And my plea to you is let us draw near. Let us draw near to prepare ourselves to enter into his presence. I mean, the Old Testament priests, before they entered into the, the Holy of Holies, they had various washings, and they had to apply the blood. They had to go to the lavender and wash their hands. I mean, there are things they had to do. You can read Leviticus 16 and see all that they had to do. You can read Exodus 30 and see what they had to do. And I believe as believers, we need to prepare our hearts daily to enter into his presence. You are perfected in Christ. You, if you are truly a born-again believer, you have an eternal relationship with him. But it doesn't mean you're always experiencing fellowship. And this is the critical factor. He's longing for us, but we need to prepare our hearts to experience fellowship with God. You can't fellowship with him when you're living in sin. You can't. You don't lose your salvation But you lose your joy, you lose your peace, you lose your contentment. I mean, you ever wonder why you're so discontented with life? You ever wonder why you have no peace, you have no joy? I'm telling you why. It's because you're not in fellowship. The more time you spend in fellowship with God, the more peace, the more joy, the more contentment you will experience because you're in his presence. How much greater does it get than being in his presence? That's why John warned us, 1 John chapter 1, from the beginning of his letter he says, this is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you, that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. Zero. Zilch. None. And if we say, if we, yeah, we, we can say a lot of things. If we say, I'm a believer, if we say, I'm a follower, if we say we have fellowship with him, yet walk in darkness, we lie. We're lying to God, we're lying to ourselves, we're lying to others. We lie. 
and do not practice the truth. He didn't say they didn't know the truth. He didn't say, and do not know the truth. He said, and do not practice. Because there's a big difference between knowing and practicing. Now that should have gotten me an amen. Somebody somewhere should have said amen. Because how many of us, man, we know so much of the truth, but do we always practice the truth? You know you should love your neighbor, but do you always love your neighbor? You know you should do all things without complaining, but do you always do all things without complaining? Some of you are complaining in your mind right now. I wish you'd stop preaching so hard, right? We can know the truth, but doesn't mean that we are going to practice the truth. And there's a big difference. Listen, the world is consumed with information, with knowledge. They want, they want to learn, learn, learn. But it doesn't do us any good to have all this information or all this knowledge if we don't have application, if we're not living it. We need to focus more on the living it part than the knowing it part. Hear me. Because some of you have been believers 10, 15, 20 years, and you're about two years old spiritually. As soon as things don't go your way, you're throwing things, you're having a fit, you're in rage, you're angry. You need to grow up spiritually by applying the truth. That's the only way we change, practicing the truth. Listen, and I know it's hard. Our feelings are going to be all over the place. But you can't live by your feelings. You got to live by faith. No matter how you feel, you have to look at what God says. And you got to lay aside the feeling so that you can walk in faith. Now, some of your feelings when you walk in faith are going to be good. Because joy is a feeling. And when you walk by faith, you will experience things that you won't experience when you live by your feelings. So you have to learn how to choose to walk by faith. Living according to his word, no matter what's going on in your head. You got to say to yourself, no, that's not what God says. You got to tell yourself the truth. Listen, you should be preaching the gospel to yourself every day of who God is and what Christ has done for you. You got to remind yourself of his goodness and how much he loves you and how he has perfected you in Christ. Because your mind's telling you, you're no good, you're a failure, you're a sinner, you're a loser. Your mind is always going to beat you down. And it's not beating you down. It's beating everybody else down around you. And like, you're a loser. You're an idiot. You're a failure. Because we are sinful by nature. But God is progressively sanctifying us by the truth. And if you're not applying the truth, there won't be sanctification. You ever watched a believer for a year, two years, and you see no growth in their life? You know they're a believer, right? You can tell. But you don't see transformation. Change doesn't happen without the application of truth. It can't. Because change doesn't happen in a vacuum. If you want real change, if you really want to grow in your relationship to Christ, you've got to look at the truth and say, how am I living this? How am I loving my neighbor? How am I showing grace and mercy? How am I walking in forgiveness? I mean, forgiveness is critical for us as believers. This should be the hallmark of our faith because God forgave us, but sometimes we hold on to stuff and we're reluctant to forgive. And yet God forgave us. So how can we not forgive somebody else who's wronged us or hurt us or stabbed us in the back or lied about us? How can we not forgive? God wants us to learn to walk in forgiveness. He wants us to practice the truth. See, you don't lose your relationship because you're not practicing the truth. But you lose your fellowship. Which means you're missing out on joy. You're missing out on peace. You're missing out on grace. You're missing out on experience, the presence of God. Because he's not going to fellowship with you while you're in sin. That's why the author goes on to say in verse 8 and 9, If we say 
We have no sin. We deceive ourselves. Now, there are people that will teach you that once you are a believer, you don't sin anymore. That's a false teaching. It's, it's not good doctrine. All right? So if you listen to a preacher and he says, I don't sin anymore, stop listening. Because he's lying to you right there. Not because I say so, because God's word says so. That's what it says. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Meaning that your fellowship is restored. Your relationship as a father, child, you're still a child, but you need that fellowship, not just the relationship. You need fellowship to grow in Christ's likeness, to experience joy, peace, and the fruit of the Spirit. You can't do that. You won't experience goodness and kindness and self-control if you're living in sin. You say, well, Scott, man, we sin every day. How do I keep short accounts? When you blow it, acknowledge it immediately. Turn to God. And then if you need to tell somebody else that you're sorry, seek their forgiveness. Say, I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Do it immediately. Don't hold on to stuff. Don't let it build up. Because the longer you're out of fellowship, the harder it gets. And you want that fellowship. I mean, Jesus died to open that door that we may enter into the presence of God, that we might draw near. It's open for all of us. Don't you want that? Of course you do, because Jesus died for you. You love him because he first loved you. But the further you get away from that fellowship, the harder it gets, the colder your heart gets. The more resistant you get to the Holy Spirit. Because you don't, you know, his voice gets more distant and distant. And then you know what happens? God disciplines you. And he chastises you. He takes you to the woodshed. Because God disciplines those he loves. He loves you. He's not going to let you go. He might let you stray for a little bit. And he'll use that. Because he works all things out for his glory. But he's going to get your attention. I just think it's easier to stay close to him. To experience his fellowship. Keep short accounts of your sin. Confess them immediately so you stay in a right relationship. So the author says, let us hold fast. So the first one was, let us draw near. And now he says, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. Not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some. But encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Let us hold fast. The readers of this epistle were being tempted to do what? To go back to the law. To forsake their confession of Christ. The writer did not exhort them to hold on to their salvation. Because their security was in Christ, not in themselves. It wasn't about them losing their salvation. He was exhorting them to hold on to their confession. He was inviting them to hold fast the confession of hope. Hope is so important for us. I mean, we long for Jesus and we believe that he's returning. I mean, the book of Hebrews is filled with hope. The hope of our inheritance, the hope of our security, the hope of our salvation, the hope of his return. You know, we need hope. Every day you've got to talk to yourself about your hope in Christ. You've got to remind yourself of what he's done and that our hope is not in this world, that our hope is in Jesus. If you put your hope in the culture, the culture is always changing. The world is always changing. Listen to me. If you put your hope in people, they will let you down. You got to put your hope in Jesus. When a believer has his hope fixed, 
I mean really fixed on Christ and relies on the faithfulness of God, he won't waver. Instead of looking back, as a lot of these Jews were doing, he'll be looking ahead to what God has in store for him. Listen, God is at work in your life. And he's already laid it out. He's got a plan for you. He's working in you and through you for his glory. He's using you, whether you know it or not. Because you belong to him. If you're a child of God and he saved you, he is going to use you for his glory. Even the hard stuff, the painful things that you've been through, he will use for his glory because he loves you. And he wants to use you to bring glory to his name. I mean, that's who we are. In Christ, we are the hope of glory. Christ in you, that's the hope of glory. So that we might present that hope to other people, that they might see Christ in us. So he says, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. Why? For he who promised is, and this is the whole point, faithful. Because he is faithful. Even when you're not, he will remain faithful to you. When you are unfaithful, he will be faithful. That's unconditional love. You won't find that in this world. You won't find anybody that will really love you unconditionally. We try as parents, right? If you have kids, you've tried to love them unconditionally. But there are moments when you'd like to strangle them, if you're honest with yourself, and you are not loving them unconditionally. You're like, what? You did that again? Ugh! It takes everything in you to, not to beat them within an inch of their life. Whether it be a child or a grandchild, you know what I'm saying? Right? It's, it's, it's not that love that God shows us. I, I want to love like that. I really do. I want to love my wife like that. I want to love my kids, my family, my friends, my grandkids. I want to I be that witness. I want to learn. And so I, I'm trying to draw near. And the more I spend time in fellowship with God, the more he is shaping me and changing me. You know, his love is amazing. And I see his work all the time. when well, we don't even realize it. You know, somebody just told me the other day about, uh, and I was sharing it with my wife, like taking Dan in for a year, right? Dan lived with us for a whole year. And somebody told me the other day at lunch, like, man, you don't even realize how many people are telling your story. I was like, what story? About how you guys would take in somebody that you didn't even know and take care of him. Not just take him in, but take care of him for a year. Like, they're like, people are just telling that story like it's amazing that you would, I mean, especially my wife didn't know him at all and allowed him to come live in our home for a year. And I was like, well, what else were we supposed to do? I mean, it's not my house, first of all. It's God's. I'm just the steward of it. Second of all, there was a need. And as believers, what are we supposed to do? Meet the need. So I, I didn't see that as peculiar, but God is using it as a testimony. And I thought, wow, I didn't even know that. And I was like, that's pretty amazing. I didn't know anybody was telling stories. And then I shared that with my wife. And she was like, what? I didn't know anybody was telling stories. But it was really awesome and encouraging at the same time to realize that God is using us. Not even like we're trying not doing anything special, just following him. And that's what I'm saying. When you follow him, he's going to use you. He's going to use you because he gets all the glory. Because it's not about us. None of this is about us. It's all about him and his glory and his work for what he's doing for his kingdom. And we get to be a part of that. I mean, we get to reign in the kingdom. Listen, you're never going to die. If that's not the greatest news you've ever heard, I don't know what it is. But I'm going to live forever in the kingdom of God. And like I said, nothing in this world is perfect. But everything is perfect in his kingdom. You know? I mean, I don't know how many of you guys love golf. But you know I do, right? 
So you might hit a shot, and you'll think, oh, that's a perfect shot. But then it doesn't go in the hole. So it's not perfect. I mean, it's only perfect if it literally goes in the hole. And that rarely ever happens. I've never had a hole in one in my whole life of golf. Not one time. Right? So there's always room for improvement. There's always looking for more. And that's the problem with our world. So we're always looking for more, and yet we have this opportunity to draw near to a God who is perfect and who has perfected us by taking away all of our sins so that we are righteous in his sight. The last part of this verse says, and not neglecting. But before it says not neglecting, he says, let us consider, you know? Let us consider. This should be our... We're invited to consider how to spur one another on to love and goodies. Now, we can't do that if we don't live in fellowship, if we're not connecting. See, our fellowship is compared this way and this way. Dino said something very interesting yesterday in the men's conference that really struck me, and I really began to think about it last night. I was like, wow, that is really an awesome uh, word picture. Like, God is a trinity, right? God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And then he created man because it wasn't good for, I mean, he created woman because it wasn't good for man to be alone. But then there was another trinity. It was God, husband, wife. Another trinity. God in the center of the relationship. And God is a triune God. And so I began to think about this fellowship. Let us draw near. But then let us consider how God put that together. How it is a trinity. It's my relationship to God and then my relationship with people. It's me and this relationship, and then it's my relationship to all the other people around me. It's like they're imperative, and they go together. If this relationship is bad, it affects my relationship with God. It does. And if my relationship with God is bad, it affects my relationship to people. So we need all three. You need to have people in your life. You need to walk a solid life. And you need to be focused on God. You, you need people. We need each other. That's why, and I love the way the text puts this, let us consider. And there's something that you should note, that it's not about you getting. It's not about being a consumer. Let us consider how we may. It's about being a contributor. The purpose of gathering isn't so you can get something. It's so that you can give to others. Let us consider how we may. So the point of coming together is to spur one another on. Your job for fellowshipping with other believers in the body of Christ is to build them up, to pray for them, to hold them accountable, to encourage them. We need each other. Because a part of us giving ourselves away is good for us. We can't isolate ourselves from one another. We need to be in real fellowship with God and then real fellowship with each other. That's why it says not neglecting, as some are in the habit of doing. Listen to me. Churches shut down during COVID. A lot of them. And we did because we made a decision that we needed fellowship. And I want you to know that no matter what happens in our culture, we're going to stay open. We need each other. If they shut churches down for good in our country, if we go that far extreme, we will still meet. Just like they meet in China. China's not allowed to have Bibles. China's not allowed to have church, but they still have church. They have it underground. Look, we need each other. Just like we need our relationship with God, but they go together. We need our relationship with God, and we need our relationship with each other. And we need to learn to live in real fellowship so that we can have accountability, so that we can encourage each other, pray for each other. Because part of that isn't what you get. It's about what you give. And learning to give yourself away is helping you to become more like God. You're never more like God than you're giving. When you're giving, you're like, God so loved the world that he did what? He gave his only begotten son. If we're going to be like Christ, we have to give ourselves away. That's why Paul said repeatedly, I am crucified with Christ. 
over and over. And a lot of his messages, he's talking about laying his life down. I mean, think about Paul getting stoned. I was talking about this yesterday in the men's conference. Or maybe it was yesterday. I don't know. I was talking about it to somebody. But think about Paul. The apostle Paul walks into the city to preach the gospel. And they stone him to, what's the word? Death. Not to sleep. That's not how it worked. They pounded you with stones until you were dead. It was called stoning. It wasn't a rock concert, all right? They piled stones on you until you were dead. I mean, they were pelting you in the face. They're hitting you in the chest. They're hitting you on the side. They're just pow, pow. Everybody just throw big rocks at you until you fall to your knees, and then they keep pounding you, and they keep pounding you until you go down until you die. So they're, they're, they stone Paul, which they think is to death, but God wasn't ready for him to die yet. And he's laying under this heap of stones. And they all turn around and walk back into the city because they drag you outside of the city when they stone you so the body doesn't stink up the city. And then Paul works his way up through the rocks. And he works his way out of the rocks and he dusts himself off, and he says, man, I got to get out of here. No, that's not what he does. He goes right back in the city to preach the gospel. After they stoned him to death. I mean, we would have been like, where's my AK? I'm going back, but I'm going back with weapons, right? We would have been like, How do we would have hauled tailed. But he went right back into the city. Why? Because there were people that needed to hear about Jesus. There were people that needed the gospel. Because he needed to lay his life down. He needed to give himself away. That's what Christ did for us. And we are following. We are followers of Christ. Christ gave himself away. We need to give ourselves away for one another for one another. We need to spur, provoke, encourage one another towards love and good deeds. So how are you doing with that? Are you spending time thinking about ways to provoke, encourage others to love and good deeds? Be intentional. Our theme this year is to live with purpose. Be intentional about spurring others on towards love and good deeds. Think about ways to pray for people. Think about how to encourage people. Think about how to hold people accountable. If they want accountable, you can't make somebody be accountable. But make yourself available by giving yourself away for these relationships so that you can be right in this relationship because they work together. We need this relationship, and we have an invitation to draw near. And then the author says, let us consider, let's ponder, let's think about how to spur one another on towards love and good deeds. And one of the things you need to do is be faithful in attendance. Listen to me, the first step in pouring yourself is showing up. If you don't show up, how can you give yourself away? It's really important to understand that, that we need each other. And we need to show up as much as we can for each other. It's critical. Something really cool I just thought you might want to see in this, and then I'll close this. You know the three Christian virtues that we talk about as Christians? Hopefully you know, right? You've been mature enough in the faith to understand that we have three Christian virtues that every Christian knows, which is faith, hope, and love, right? Paul talked about that in 1 Corinthians 13. Faith, hope, and love, and now remains love, which is the greatest of these. But faith, hope, and love are like the three Christian virtues that we should be displaying, living in. Well, the author did something really cool. If you really looked at the text, he talked about the assurance of our faith in verse 23, and then, I mean, in verse 22, and then he talked about the foundation of our hope in verse 23, and then in verse 24, he talked about spurring each other on towards love. In verse 24, faith, hope, and love. I thought it was really cool. 
I just saw that, and as I was going through each verse, I was like, wow, faith, hope, love. You know, the three virtues that we should be living for, admonishing, encouraging, being an example to the rest of the world of what it means to live by faith, to walk in hope, and to love each other with his love. Will you pray with me? Oh, wait, I didn't give you the verse that I want you to meditate on. It's simple. You already, I already saw the verse, so it's First John. Look, think about this this week. You need fellowship with God. You need fellowship with God, and sin keeps you from fellowship. Confess your sins, right? Meditate on this verse. This is the message we've heard from him and proclaimed to you. God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we claim or if we say that we have fellowship with him, yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. Let's practice the truth. Let's be believers, followers that practice the truth. Amen? That, that's my desire for you. My desire for me is that we practice the truth because that's how we bring glory and honor to his name. Lord, thank you that you've given us the truth that we might practice it. Father, you've put it in our hands. You've given us your word. You've opened the door for us to have real fellowship with you any moment of every day. God, we can be with you as much as we choose. So I pray that you would draw us close to your heart, that we would learn to draw near, God, that every day we would desire more and more of you. And at the same time, God, as we are desiring this <laughs> incomprehensible relationship that you've opened up for us with you, that we would truly desire to be a light in this world, to be an example. And God, that we would be in real fellowship with other believers, that we would give ourselves away, Father, really giving ourselves for your glory and for your honor, that you might be exalted in us. Lord, we love you, and we want you to speak to us today. Change us. Convict us, Father. Challenge us. Have your way in our lives. For your glory, God, and for your name's sake. In Jesus' name, amen.